Hello, everyone, and welcome to the TMA Ask the Expert podcast series. Today's session is entitled, An Update on the Outbreak of Paralysis in the U.S., Acute Flaccid Myelitis. My name is Roberta Pesce, and I'm the Research and Project Manager at the Transverse Myelitis Association. We are a nonprofit focused on support, education, and research of rare neuroimmune diseases. You can learn more about us by going to our website at myelitis.org. We're pleased that Sam Hughes from UT Southwestern in Dallas, Texas is joining us today as our guest moderator. Before I turn it over to you, Sam, a few housekeeping pieces. This podcast is being recorded and will be made available on the TMA website at myelitis.org. During the call, if you have any additional questions, please send them to us via our Facebook page at facebook.com slash myelitis. Sam, could you start us off by introducing our speakers? Uh, great. Thanks, Roberta. I'll do that. I'm honored to be guest hosting this podcast today, and I'm pleased to be joined by Drs. Benjamin Greenberg and Terry Schreiner. Dr. Greenberg is an associate professor at UT Southwestern Medical Center and is recognized internationally as an expert in rare autoimmune disorders of the central nervous system. He splits his clinical time between seeing both adult and pediatric patients. His research interests are in both the diagnosis and treatment of transverse myelitis, neuromyelitis optica, encephalitis, multiple sclerosis, and infections of the central nervous system. He has also led an effort to improve biorepository development and has created uniform protocols for sample handling and analysis. Dr. Schreiner is a neuroimmunology specialist at the University of Colorado and pediatric neurologist at Children's Hospital Colorado. She has subspecialized in pediatric onset demyelinating disorders of the central nervous system and has begun a multidisciplinary clinic for children with these disorders. Her areas of interest include immune-mediated neurologic disease, quality of life in pediatric patients with demyelinating disease, biomarkers of multiple sclerosis, and participation in clinical trials. To start things off today, I'd like to have uh, both Dr. Greenberg and Dr. Schreiner uh, um, explain a little bit about the phenomenon that we're seeing now with enterovirus-related paralysis, and could you please give us an overview of how this relates to this new designation of acute flaccid myelitis and what kind of experience you've had? Sure, Sam. Uh, first, thanks for moderating, and uh, as always, to the Transverse Myelitis Association for making this happen. Um, so the, the history of this, and, and we'll be explaining the terminology as well as how this fits into to categories of disease, but the, the history of this uh, actually goes back a little ways. Um, more than a year ago, uh, we started at uh, the Transverse Myelitis Center here in Dallas looking at our data over a five-year period of time and recognizing that we had been seeing uh, one to four cases per year of children who were diagnosed with transverse myelitis, who definitely had the signs and symptoms of transverse myelitis, but had some atypical features, some unusual features based on the pattern of weakness and what parts of the nervous system were being damaged. And we started looking at these cases and recognizing that a subset of them, a small subset of them, had what looked to be um, damage to what's called the lower motor neuron. So, you, you have two neurons that connect your brain to your muscles, the upper, which goes from your brain to the spinal cord, and the lower, which goes from the spinal cord to the muscle. And this lower motor neuron, the first millimeter of its existence, including its cell body, its, its, its uh, computer hard drive, if you will, lives within the spinal cord. And what we saw was in a group of our kids with transverse myelitis, it was actually this this central computer of that lower motor neuron within the spinal cord that was getting selectively damaged. And this pattern of damage is what had been seen decades ago in the setting of polio. So we started looking into this when last spring, uh, colleagues in California who had noted a similar uh, pattern uh, put out uh, a uh, publication and an abstract about 20 pediatric cases over a two to three year period of time who had a very similar presentation, and in some of them, they had tested positive for a virus known as an enterovirus, which is a very common illness and, and uh, common cause of colds among children throughout the summer and the fall. So while conversations were going on nationwide about what we uh, had seen and what was being seen specifically in California, there was an apparent outbreak of respiratory infections from enterovirus D68, which is one of the types of enteroviruses, uh, 
And in the context of this, some uh, unusual and, and uh, startling cases were identified by our colleagues in Colorado. And, and I'm glad Dr. Schreiner could join us today because she's the expert on this and can get us up to speed on what happened in Colorado and, and where it's taken us today. So I'll turn things over to Terry. Okay, thank you, Ben. Um, it is a pleasure to be here for this podcast, and I thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm uh, happy to talk about what we've been experiencing in Colorado over the last couple months because, as Dr. Greenberg mentioned, this is um, uh, – it is something that we have seen previously, but we are currently seeing in much greater numbers. And so we are trying to understand this as these cases unfold um, uh, and so that we may, may hopefully learn more about, uh, as we go, treatment and prevention. But first, let me tell you a little bit about what we have seen here in Colorado. So beginning around the beginning of August, we started to see patients coming in every week or so with this distinctive pattern of spinal cord involvement that Dr. Greenberg described. The uh, MRIs showed that there was involvement of the part of the spinal cord that Dr. Greenberg referred to as the, the computer, the centralized computer for the motor functions, the movement functions of the body. And we saw clinically that these patients had varying degrees of weakness in one or more of their limbs. And this seemed to correlate to what we were seeing on the MRI. The weakness that we saw in these patients was um, a little distinctive in that it was uh, what we call a flaccid weakness, meaning that the limbs were loose. They weren't tight, as oftentimes can happen in um, this syndrome that we know is transverse myelitis, but we'll talk a little bit more about characterizing that. But these patients that we saw in Colorado had loose weakness. They did not have reflexes. And what was particular further to our patients here is that the vast majority of them also had involvement of what we call the cranial nerves. And these are nerves that come directly off of the bottom part of the brain called the brain stem and control functions of the the face and the the throat and neck. And so what we were seeing is not only did these patients have weakness in their body, but they also had facial weakness, so one side of their face was weak or they had difficulties with eye movement, so they complained of double vision or they had difficulty speaking and swallowing. Um, so, so this was something that was particular to the patients that we were seeing, which was distinct in many ways from what we have seen before. Now, we have seen patients with each of these findings previously, but at much rarer intervals. Um, so in other words, we might see a patient who has um, uh, facial weakness with a spot on their MRI um, that would correlate with that. We may uh, or did in intervals see patients who had this particular kind of weakness called the flaccid weakness. But what is different to what we've experienced in the last couple months is that we are seeing these things together and in much greater numbers than we have previously. As Dr. Greenberg mentioned, this is co-occurring at a time where the respiratory illness caused by this virus called enterovirus D68 is markedly increased against what has been reported for you know, many, many prior years. We are seeing um, uh, thousands of, of kids affected with these respiratory illnesses. And though we haven't proven that these two things are related, our suspicion is that this virus may in fact be playing a role in what we are seeing with um, this weakness, the flaccid weakness, the particular changes on the MRI, and in Colorado, the um, appearance also of facial weakness and difficulty swallowing. Thank you for that, for that clarification. 
a lot of our listeners out there uh, who who have transverse myelitis or or have it in the context of NMO are used to the conversation they've had with their providers about the cause of their TM or how the damage was done. Um, is there is the from what we understand is the way that the paralysis uh, caused by the enterovirus the same or how is it different from what's uh, expected in a normal case of transverse myelitis. So, Sam, I think there's two parts to the answer to that, that question. Um, the first has to do just with patterns of what we're seeing. And when you open up textbooks about transverse myelitis, and frankly, when I have taught uh, courses or given lectures uh, about transverse myelitis, we have usually defined it as a disease that affects uh, that first wire, whether it be motor or sensory, um, connecting the brain and the spinal cord. Uh, in the past, we have never uh, defined it as a condition or, or have not explicitly defined it as a condition affecting that second wire that goes from the spinal cord to the muscle. And so purely based on patterns, what we're seeing now, the syndrome we're seeing, which we're using the term acute flaccid myelitis, um, is that that second wire is being affected, sometimes in combination with the first and sometimes in isolation. And the term flaccid, acute flaccid myelitis, is basically a recognition of the type of weakness somebody gets when that second wire is affected. It's a what's called a flaccid or loose type of weakness, which is different than most of the patients we see with transverse myelitis. When the first wire is affected, they tend to get tight muscles and stiffness. But when that second wire is affected, people have floppy arms or legs, then they don't develop the tightness, hence we term it flaccid weakness. So the pattern is different than the traditional transverse myelitis we've seen in cases of idiopathic transverse myelitis or neuromyelitis optica. The second thing that is different uh, has to do with mechanism of damage, and this is where more research needs to be done. We, in idiopathic transverse myelitis or neuromyelitis optica, the mechanism of damage has been relatively well established to be an immune-mediated attack of the spinal cord, specifically those those first wires, the sensory and motor wires connecting the brain and the spinal cord. In what we're seeing now with the lower motor neuron, that second wire being affected, we have a suspicion but have not conclusively proven that it's a direct viral infection of that second neuron. And that's where the research is going right now, to prove that indeed it is the virus affecting the neuron. And what we have seen, and, and I'd be interested in uh, Dr. Schreiner's comments on this, would be that in uh, a large number of these children who have what seemed to be a virally induced damage to that lower motor neuron, there's a large number of them who are also having damage at the exact same time to that first wire, the upper motor neuron, or some of the sensory fibers that we think may be due to swelling or inflammation. So as the immune system goes in to fight off the virus, we may be getting accessory damage which is what we more classically see in the pattern of, tran of typical transverse myelitis. And so the, the difference between what we're seeing now and, and frankly what we've seen in the past through traditional transverse myelitis is the pattern of damage and the suspected mechanism of injury. Yes, I, I agree. So what, what we have seen with our patients here in Colorado is that many of them are presenting with pain so pain in the lower back, pain in a limb, and that precedes actually the weakness that we see. What we haven't seen in our patients is following the onset of weakness, any change in their sensory function. And again, this is one feature that is distinctive from what we have uh, from idiopathic transverse myelitis, where we may have both sensory and motor involved, meaning you might lose sensation um, as well as um, gain weakness. We're not seeing that in our patients here. Moreover, we're not seeing other things that are typically um, seen in idiopathic transverse myelitis or NMO or even ADEM, and that is we're not seeing that there's any effect on bowel or bladder function. And we're, we're actually not seeing um, spots on the MRI that are above the brainstem, and this is uh, this is 
Mm, similar to um, idiopathic transverse myelitis, but in other disorders like ADEM, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, or NMO, disorders that may also affect the spinal cord, it's not uncommon to see lesions in the brain, so lesions on MRI that are above the brainstem. But that's something that we are, are not, um, not really seeing in our population here. Uh, so, Dr. Schreiner, um, one question that came from the community with this is, what is the recovery like for patients uh, with acute flaccid myelitis? And are rehab protocols for TM applicable uh, to these types of patients? I think that is a great question, and I think that is something that we are just beginning to unfold now with with our current population. So, as as we've both discussed, we have seen episodically patients that are similar to what we're seeing now over the past couple years. Um, and we can extrapolate perhaps a little bit of how they have done into how we expect our population with these current symptoms to do. But it's not clear that they are identical. And so we need to be cautious in prognosticating too much um, based on cases that we've seen in the past. What we have um, learned from our colleagues in California, who also over the last two years in particular have seen 20 or so patients with similar findings, is that the recovery is is gradual. It is a hard-fought battle, um, and many of the um, children and adults that have been affected in the California cohort have improved over time, but it has been with significant effort, particularly in the realm of therapies. Um, what we have seen here in Colorado, particularly in this group that has just presented since August, is similar in that there have been improvements um, but it has been gradual, and I think it's been um, uh, frustrating in that it hasn't been as robust as we would have hoped. Now, that being said, it's only a couple months since our first patient presented, and so it's, I think, too too early to say for sure what the outcome is going to be. But we're all, we're all cautious, and we are, um, at least here in Colorado, advocating for intensive rehabilitation. Um, I don't think that there is a downside to that, and I think what we know from uh, from spinal cord injury of all different causes is that the therapy really is the um, uh, the gold standard, the best thing to do to um, facilitate recovery. Thank you for that. Um, so one question that just came in. Um, with idiopathic transverse myelitis, uh, some patients uh, come um, come in saying that uh, they've been told that it's a post-infectious TM. Would this acute flaccid myelitis be considered a post-infectious TM or uh, maybe an infectious TM? Dr. Greenberg? So that's the proverbial $64,000 question. Um, I'll tell you my guess right now, but it, it, we are working on the data to prove it. My guess is that uh, this distinct entity is actually an infectious, um, very specific subtype of uh, myelitis, basically akin to what polio was. Polio was a direct viral infection of these lower motor neurons, and we think that's what's happening um, uh, in these cases, although it is yet unproven. It is possible, although I think unlikely, that uh, what's happening in these kids is they're getting the respiratory infection and then weeks later their immune system is attacking the spinal cord. Um, I think that's less likely than uh, the virus directly causing the damage, but um, that's where the research is focusing on right now, trying to separate out those two things. Okay. Uh, so, Dr. Schreiner, we're really only hearing about these cases uh, like this in children, but can this also happen in adults? Um, yes. I, I don't have any reason to suspect that it couldn't happen in adults um, for reasons that I think we're still trying to unfold. Most of what, almost, well, all of what we've seen here in Colorado has involved children less than 18 years old. Um, 
again, looking to what we hear from our colleagues across the country and particularly in California, there have been adult cases that have fit this case definition. So this um, criteria that we have established to try and really um, explicitly uh, identify these cases and differentiate them from others. So there have been adults who have met that criteria. Um, I know of cases in California. I can't say whether or not they have um, occurred elsewhere in the country. I suspect that they have. Uh, here in Colorado, we have had uh, one case that I know of that was not um, typical, but potentially similar enough to be considered in this cohort. Um, but I really have not heard of, of other um, adults being affected locally here. Okay. Um, another question that has uh, come in from a number of, of people, specifically parents, um, of uh, children with uh, a history of TM is that could it, is enterovirus contagious and more specifically um, uh, the paralysis that could be caused by the enterovirus? Uh, is this somehow contagious and should they be concerned um, for their children? Yeah. Dr. Greenberg? So it's a great question and I think we can be pretty reassuring here. So enterovirus um, all enteroviruses are contagious. They're spread by uh, sneezing, coughing, and being exposed to somebody with enterovirus who is sneezing or coughing. It is, enterovirus is extremely common. I think the statistics that I see the most cite uh, two to four million children a year in the United States get upper respiratory infections from enterovirus. And these tend to be mild and um, uh, you wouldn't even know it. Uh, you know, as a, a father, you know, if a kid comes home with a little runny nose and a cough and, and even a low-grade fever, you really don't think twice about it. And in the case of enterovirus, uh, the neurologic complications are exceedingly rare. If uh, Dr. Schreiner and I have had conversations with colleagues around the country and indeed around North America, and even though we're in the midst of a major outbreak of r respiratory infections, thankfully we are still seeing uh, relatively few uh, cases of paralysis. Um, so if we don't know the firm number, but let's say there's 100 uh, cases this summer of paralysis, uh, that would be out of millions of respiratory infections. So the percentage, the likelihood of having this severe complication, I think, is extremely small. What has also not been reported, and, and I'll defer to Dr. Schreiner on this for the Colorado experience, is in families or schools where one child gets the paralytic form, we're not seeing uh, at least multiple people get the paralytic form. From what I've seen, and again, I'll defer to Dr. Schreiner, is in areas where there is a higher rate of the respiratory infections, there is a higher rate of the neurologic complications, and it seems to just follow the statistics, and, and not yet that there is a unique paralytic form of this virus. And so it's whether or not somebody has a complication from an infection is partly due to the infection and partly due to how a host handles the infection. Uh, and we're trying to sort out those specific details in, in the case of enterovirus. But um, Terry, have you in the Colorado experience had multiple kids from one family or one school uh, come in each with paralysis or have they been spread out around the community? I'm not sure if we lost Terry. Sam, are you still there? Oh, sorry, oh. my apologies. <laughs> I oh, there we go. I muted it. My yeah, that, it happens to me all the time. So uh, um, okay. So yeah. no, I, I yes, I heard the question. I was um, agreeing with you that of our 12 cases, we've seen um, only one from an outlying area. So 11 of them have been from the Denver metro area. One has been from a more rural um, location, but none of them have shared a school or a church or a community, they've really been distributed throughout the Denver metro area. And so we don't have um, any reason to believe right now um, that the paralytic form is contagious. Rather, in uh, you know synchrony with what you had said, we believe this is a rare, very rare complication of a very common respiratory illness. Mm -hmm. Uh, another question that came in 
Um, Sam, can I make one last comment on that, um, yes. which I, I think behooves us to make, and that is relative to prevention. Um, the the way to prevent even the rare instances of paralysis is to prevent the spread of the respiratory infection. And so, you know, it's the old adage, hand washing and antibacterial uh, and antimicrobial um, hand lotions like Purell um, are our best defense uh, against our, our kids becoming sick. And so um, I'm looking for schools, for example. I'd love to see uh, teachers at the door as kids move from class to class and everyone Purell their hands as they're moving around the school. I think things like that would go a long way to cutting the transmission rate of the respiratory side of things um, than, than anything else. And so if I were a parent out there, I'd be um, sending my kids to school with a, a little bottle of uh, Purell or any other antimicrobial lotion and, and have them use it in between classes. Thanks. That's a very important point. Um, we had a question that came in from the community. Uh, uh, as a mom with TM, so an adult woman with a history of transverse myelitis, um, should I be concerned that my children could be more susceptible? Are their chances greater than normal? Uh, the short answer is no. Um, we, we've got a pretty good experience through, the, frankly, the Transverse Myelitis Association um, and the surveys that have gone out uh, via them to over 10,000 members, and we have done searches here in, in Dallas and our, our colleagues in Baltimore, and it is exceedingly rare for family members to have more than one individual affected by transverse myelitis, and so, or including this version of things. So I, I think the history of a prior idiopathic TM would not in the family would not change the risk, frankly, uh, much or at all in terms of other family members getting this condition. Um. One question uh, uh, that I thought was important, um, in the acute setting of patients with the acute flaccid myelitis, do you treat those similarly or differently than those with a typical idiopathic TM? I can, I can att uh, address that. So we have um, tried a variety of approaches to um, treating the patients here. Um, when the first case presented, we, uh, though there were different features, we attempted to treat it as we would idiopathic TM um, with steroids, plasmapheresis, and really found there was no effect. As further cases um, presented, we um, tried different therapies, including intravenous immunoglobulins. Um, we've even tried experimental antiviral drugs that have been tested um, against enteroviruses. Um, but unfortunately, none of the medical therapies that we have chosen have shown an appreciable benefit. Um, so we are, you know, continuing to hope that we can find something that would um, help with what we believe to be an acute viral infection. But as of yet, I don't think that we have anything that has convincingly altered the course from a medical perspective. Now, as we mentioned before, we are um, encouraging therapy in these patients and we are treating them um, supportively and symptomatically. What that means is that when they're in the hospital, of course, if they're having difficulty breathing because of their involvement, then we support that. Um, you know, if there's difficulty with swallowing, we are helping with that. Um, the ongoing recovery from weakness, we are um, advocating for intense rehabilitation. Um, but from a a medical standpoint, we have yet to find something that has really successfully treated these patients. And I don't know, Dr. Greenberg, if you have a different experience. No, I think our, similar, our, our experiences have been quite similar. The one piece I'd add to it is in reference to a lot of the kids who have evidence of um, this flaccid paralysis, the lower motor neuron uh, paralysis, uh, but in addition to inflammation or swelling affecting the other parts of the cord. And in those situations in particular, we have been offering acute therapy similar to what we use in more traditional transverse myelitis or historical transverse myelitis. I, it's too early for me to know whether or not it, it's 
made a distinct difference, and we obviously have not done it as part of a controlled study, so we may never know. But out of an abundance of caution, if, if we see damage in the spinal cord beyond that lower motor neuron, we are still aggressively treating that inflammation and swelling and doing all the things that Dr. Schreiner and her team have been doing relative to supportive care. I'll also note that there are certain options after the event um, that are available to these patients that are not available to traditional transverse myelitis patients, specifically if um, a child has an ongoing weakness resulting from a lower motor neuron injury. We uh, work with a surgeon here at Dallas who, for some kids, have pursued nerve transplant procedures to try and bring back function to that lower motor neuron, and that's something that would not work um, for people who have isolated upper motor neuron weakness. And so while we're limited in the acute setting for these children, we do push the rehab very aggressively, like Dr. Schreiner, and also offer um, some of these surgical procedures later on, six months to a year down the line, if uh, people are not improving as a way to try and bring back function. So another uh, question that came from the community, um, with the enterovirus D68, are we really only seeing cases of um, spinal cord involvement, or should there be concern that it could have other um, neurologic deficits like optic neuritis or something of that nature? I can um, address that from the Colorado experience um, here. So we have, um, in all but two of our cases, seen the distinctive spinal cord involvement. But in, in two cases of enterovirus 68, we have seen uh, exclusively the brain stem involvement. And this is something that I mentioned earlier that results in the facial weakness, the difficulty swallowing and speaking, the difficulty controlling eye movement. So, um, so I do think the virus has functions or is causing effects outside of the spinal cord, um, but I have not seen um, an optic neuritis associated with this. Um, in terms of other um, body systems. I have heard across the country of one patient who had a flaccid paralysis thought to be associated with enterovirus and a cardiomyopathy, so heart, heart dysfunction. Um, that is the only case I've heard of that has had um, uh, cardiac effects. Um, I don't know, Dr. Greenberg, if you've had other experiences with enterovirus affecting systems outside the nervous system. So um, enteroviruses in general uh, have been reported to affect a variety of parts of the body and, and obviously the lungs for respiratory infection and, and rare cases of, of cardiac issues, extremely rare. From a nervous system perspective, I've, I have not heard of an optic neuritis case in the setting of enterovirus. Um, Dr. Schreiner uh, outlined her, her experience uh, um, that's been seen elsewhere in terms of the brainstem being affected. And there are some cases in the nation, two to four right now, that are being investigated for what looks like an encephalitis or a cerebral edema, meaning uh, a swelling of the brain. Um, but in terms of discrete damage to the nervous system, I think the spinal cord and the brainstem, at least in the context of our current experience, are the, the top two places that are being reported. There's also uh, some concern coming from the community um, uh, expressing that we're hearing about these uh, enterovirus-related cases now, um, but is it possible that cases like these have been occurring for many, many years now um, thinking in terms of those idiopathic TM patients who who were called post-infectious TM. We, we've touched on this uh, thus far in this hour, um, but maybe, Dr. Greenberg, could you elaborate more on um, the odds that this is something new versus something that's existing that we're just now really seeing? Yeah, I'll tell you again my suspicion. We can't go back and prove it, but I, I don't think this is new. Um, I think there are patients in the world who have been diagnosed with idiopathic transverse myelitis who actually had what we would now call acute flaccid myelitis. If we prove these cases are related to enterovirus, I think it's been around uh, for many years, um, and I think it's been around at, frankly, just a very low rate. 
uh, more prevalent in children than adults, um, and uh, we are working backwards to try and get a sense as to how many and how prevalent it would be in the past. And if you look, um, one of the things that's worth noting is what may have driven this is there may be some enteroviruses that are more likely to call neurologic disease than others, and we know this to be true. Enterovirus D68 and Enterovirus 71 uh, are the two enteroviruses out of the more than 70 different ones that have been most commonly associated with neurologic conditions. And it's just that D68 has not been a very common uh, respiratory virus in the United States. Um, if you look back over uh, the last 40 years, there's some data to suggest that it's been a very rare cause of colds in the U.S., that it's been other enteroviruses. And what may be happening now is that we're just seeing a bigger number, a bigger infection of this specific type of enterovirus so that we're seeing all at once many more cases of the neurologic complication. But as the questioner suggests, I think it's been there at a very low level uh, for years. Um, and it's in the context of an outbreak. And frankly, it was in the year leading up to the outbreak where we started to get the sense that indeed this was going on at a very random, very rare level. Uh, the summer has been a wake-up call, though, for the, the national community and, and the research community about really focusing in on this entity and trying to get a sense as to how prevalent is it and is this something that would happen again in large numbers. Thank you for that clarification. Um, Dr. Schreiner, we had a, a concern. Uh, should parents of children uh, who have TM uh, uh, be concerned about any kind of recurrence should their child get the enterovirus? So I I don't think, based on what we know right now, that there should be any increased worry for a child who has already had an idiopathic transverse myelitis. I think this is a very rare occurrence after an enterovirus infection, so a common respiratory infection. And I don't think that having had an event in the past places them at any greater risk for having this, um, this sequelae, this effect of the respiratory illness. So I, I can um, sympathize that that is something that would uh, would be of concern to parents of a child with TM, but I don't think that there's any increased risk for those children. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, so uh, there's a little bit of concern out there about is there anything being done now or being prepared to be done to prevent new enterovirus infections and any subsequent paralysis? I'm thinking in terms of um, the concern uh, a century ago about polio, and um, um, is there a possibility that a vaccine could be created um, for enterovirus D68, um, or what kind of things are being done to, to prevent this turning into something bigger than it is? Well, um, I, I can tell you about conversations I've had, and, I, and I'm sure Dr. Schreiner has had them as well, and obviously would, would want her to chime in, but uh, prevention is um, important and achievable, but currently the only prevention mechanisms we have is uh, at, at the grassroots level, again, of hand washing, hand sanitizing, cleaning at school, disinfecting at schools and in public places, and trying to prevent uh, spread of a pretty common virus, frankly. And so it's really hygiene uh, that, that prevents the spread. Relative to prevention campaigns around vaccination, uh, there are currently no vaccines for enteroviruses, but there is definitely large-scale discussions uh, this summer happening around that. But the challenge is doing the science first to find out if it's a single or just a handful of the over 70 different types of enteroviruses that are responsible for this issue, meaning if it's just D68 that leads to paralysis, then working on a vaccination uh, program and developing one would make perfect sense. If, however, through the research we find out that it's multiple different enteroviruses that could cause this complication, then you have to develop a vaccine that covers more than one virus. And so before 
just leaping into vaccination programs uh, that may or may not be helpful. We have to do the work over this year to really try and sort out, A, is this enterovirus that's directly causing the damage, and B, of the enteroviruses, which one or ones are uh, uh, doing the damage, and then work on uh, what would be the possible vaccination um, options for those enteroviruses. Dr. Schreiner, do you have anything to add to Dr. Greenberg's comment? No, I think that was uh, was a very nice explanation. I think we uh, suspect that these cases, at least um, perhaps the bulk of them, are affiliated, associated with the enterovirus 68. But proving that is a, a distinct um, necessary first step before we engage in um, developing a vaccine um, against it. Now, we've... Uh, you know, had great success with a polio vaccine, I think we would be able to, over time, um, come up with one for enterovirus, at least I would hope so. But I don't, uh, I don't think we're there yet. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that leads into a, a good um, a question regarding what, what is being done now in terms of the research um, uh, between uh, you two, Dr. Greenberg and Dr. Schreiner, and any other uh, providers and researchers uh, around the nation or internationally um, with this concern. Is there uh, uh, anything that you can share about what's being done now um, to look at the long-term future of, of this concern? Dr. Greenberg, do you want to take that one? Well, um, happy to. Um, you know, as as we're looking at things and planning, I, I think it, it kind of gets back into what we were talking about. Um, you know, this is, I, you know, as we've learned from all the different infectious uh, uh, scares going on in the nation right now, and here in Dallas, you, you can't walk two feet without talking about Ebola. And uh, the second conversation is about enterovirus and paralysis. Um, I, I think it's starting with the... You know, simple things that, that we know make a difference now and then figuring out where to best put resources um, moving forward on the prevention, the acute treatment, the rehabilitation. One of the things uh, we're paying attention to is we should, and I stress should, be coming towards the end of our enterovirus season. Um, usually these viruses, depending on where you live in the country and what your climate is, go from summer into fall. And one of the things we're going to pay careful attention to, and the CDC is, is very aggressively involved in, is sorting out what happens over the next few months. Will this stop being an issue? And then the plan right now is to have everything in place, assuming it does stop being an issue, meaning we don't get new cases at a, at a high rate, and that the cases stop presenting as we get into the deep winter and into the spring, have everything prepared for the upcoming year to find out, do the cases start reappearing again? What happened in polio was we, we had intermittent cases and intermittent outbreaks for decades before it became a massive public health uh, in terms of numbers uh, issue where we had tens and even 100,000 children who, who were affected. And what we're working for is the plans for the future so that we can have an earlier, much better warning system relative to uh, this condition and what its public health impact is going to be. And ultimately, those studies and those numbers dictate what resources get dedicated to issues like this uh, for prevention and treatment. Thank you for that clarification, Dr. Greenberg. Um, Dr. Schreiner, do you have anything to, to add in terms of uh, the research that's being done now? Um, well, I guess I would just mention the study that uh, that the uh, Transverse Myelitis Association and Dr. Greenberg are specifically working on called the CAPTURE study, which is trying to enroll patients who are presenting with all different kinds of myelitis within um, a couple months of presentation to learn more about their experience. This is one way that um, that we are trying to get a sense of uh, not only incidents but also patient experience going forward. Um, that is uh, 
uh, one one study. I think there will be many, many studies that uh, will be done to try and better understand specifically what is happening right now. And again, to try to uh, get to the heart of causation. So is this truly something that is being caused by the enterovirus D68 virus? Mm. Uh, thank you both. This has been a thoroughly informative uh, uh, podcast, very educational. Um, is there Are there any final words as we uh, wrap this up from either uh, you, Dr. Greenberg, or Dr. Schreiner, uh, regarding um, what the uh, enterovirus D68 and the acute flaccid myelitis um, um, really means to the community and what our final thoughts should be as we uh, continue through the weekend and, and the next month through the, through the winter season? Dr. Greenberg? So the, the closing points I, I tend to make after these conversations is, is twofold. Uh, one, on the one hand, uh, this is a serious issue. This, this is something that is appropriately uh, garnering, garnering the attention of the CDC, of uh, clinicians and scientists nationwide, um, frankly, to ensure we invest the right resources out of an abundance of caution uh, to try and treat uh, the, the children who are currently affected and ultimately prevent this from becoming a, a large public health uh, crisis. At the same time, I stress reassurance that even though this is cause for concern in terms of keeping our eye on it and appropriating resources, thankfully this is still an extraordinary rare event. Um, uh, to all of the families who have been affected, it doesn't matter how rare it is, they have been affected and we need to make sure they get adequate care. But from a public health perspective, in terms of parents and families being afraid of what could happen, uh, the, the reassurance I give is um, that this should not be a, a cause of panic uh, or over-concern by any means because the episodes are so exceedingly rare. And so we, we have to take a balanced approach of paying attention, trying to have good hygiene, uh, trying to prevent where we can. But if and when uh, our children come home sick with a cold and a fever, it should not uh, cause panic um, because your odds of... Uh, anything catastrophic happening are thankfully extremely small. Yes, I, I would agree. I think we are uh, taking this seriously as we must uh, to try and better understand what is going on with this, this group of patients. Um, I think we should not um, worry. I, I think that um, the simple things that we've discussed already in terms of preventing spread of disease, like washing your hands, coughing into your arm rather than, you know, ambient air, all of those things will be important, I think, in um, uh, trying to prevent the spread of this virus for the remaining um, months of, of the fall, month or months. I, I think what might um, the, the good that might come of this is that um, more attention is being drawn to the different types of myelitis, and this uh, outbreak may help us to get to the bottom of really differentiating what previously has been a, a rather heterogeneous group. And so if we can further identify the uh, specifics of what's happening in this outbreak, how that's different from other cases, um, and how treatments might vary, I think that in the end we will uh, have gained significant knowledge and ability to help uh, future patients. Thank, thank you both. Thank you, Dr. Greenberg and Dr. Schreiner, for uh, uh, sharing your time and your expertise today with the community and for uh, your leadership and being the front lines of care and research with these patients. Uh, and thank you to all of our li listeners out there and your questions. Um, as a reminder, this podcast is uh, recorded and will be posted on myelitis.org uh, uh, with the other uh, podcasts from the past. And we look forward to your questions um, for uh, the November podcast and uh, hope everybody has a great weekend coming up. Thank you all again. Thank you.